Well, it's good to see everybody out this morning, and thanks for coming out. Uh, it's a lot more nervous on this side of the pulpit than, the, than there where you are. <laughs> but bow with me for a moment or two, for a short moment of prayer, before we open the Word. <clears throat> Father, as we come into thy holy presence again this morning, Lord, Lord, we thank thee that we can come into thy presence through the new and living way. We thank you, Lord, that we've been singing about this rock that is higher than any of us. Lord, we thank you that thy word tells us that the name of the Lord is a high tower and the righteous can runneth unto it. Lord, as we run in this morning, Lord, and ask for thy help and seek thy face, seek thy help and seek thy blessing for this meeting this morning, Lord, we hand the whole thing over to thee. We thank thee, Lord, that there is one seated at the right hand of the Father in heaven, making intercession for each and every one of us this morning. Father, we thank Thee for Thy Word that is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We thank Thee for the one that has lived a perfect life, lived a sinless life, died a death, and rose again the third day. We thank Thee for the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. Lord, as we come now, we can say like the Apostle Paul of old, Lord, He, he was weak and spoke with, uh, spoke with feeble speech, yet, Lord, we know that my grace is sufficient for Thee, He said. Lord, as we come, I pray now, Lord, that thou would hide us, hide us behind the cross of Calvary. Pray, Lord, that thou would fill us afresh. Help us this morning as we open thy word. Think of the disciples on the sea of Tiberias and the Savior could say, have ye any meat? We pray, Lord, this morning for that word in season. We pray, Lord, we would be fit to feed the flock of God this morning. We thank thee for this assembly. We thank thee for everyone that thou hast gathered out this morning. And we pray that you would meet each and every one of us at the point of need. For we ask it in the Saviour's name. Amen. Amen. You have a Bible with you this morning. Turn into a few different passages. Hopefully time won't beat us. Turn to firstly to Second Chronicles, please. Second Chronicles into chapter 12. Easiest first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, first and then second Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 12. And we'll go for another uh, reading or two after that. Second Chronicles chapter 12, and just go from verse 1. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. And it came to pass that in the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem because they had transgressed against the Lord with 1,200 chariots and threescore thousand horsemen and the people were without number that came with them out of Egypt. And then down to verse number five, then came Shemaiah the prophet of Rehoboam and to the princes of Judah that were gathered together to Jerusalem because of Shishak and said unto them, thus saith the Lord, ye have forsaken me and therefore I have also left you in the hand of Shishak. Verse nine is the verse we're interested in this morning. So Shishak king of Egypt came up against Jerusalem and took away the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king's house. He took all he carried away to the, also the shields of gold which Solomon had made. Instead of which King Rehoboam made shields of brass, shields of brass, and committed them to the hands of the chief of the guard that kept the entrance of the king's house. And when the king entered into the house of the Lord, the guard came and fetched them and brought them again up into the into the guard chamber. Turn with me then over to uh, 1 Corinthians, please. 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, just the first verse will suffice. 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, that well-known chapter, the chapter of love. Just verse 1. Apostle Paul speaking, he could say, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, that is, I am become as a sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of, the, of angels and have not charity, I am become as a sounding brass or as a tinkling cymbal. Then you can turn to it if you want our last reading in the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1, going from verse 12. John on the Isle of Patmos, when he's seen that mighty vision of the Saviour, he could say, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me, 
And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about with the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white as like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. And he, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the, the sun shineth in his strength. Amen. And we know the Lord will bless the reading of his word. You can keep your Bible open, sure, at First Chronicle, or Second Chronicles 12, at Second Chronicles 12. Well, this is the story we want to look at this morning, most of all, in Second Chronicles chapter 12. I'm sure as we've read those verses, you've noticed with me the theme that has ran through the three verses. In Second Chronicles 12, we've Rehoboam, the king of Judah, making brass shields. In First Corinthians 13, Paul said, though he spoke with the tongues of angels, if he had not love, he's become as a sounding brass and as a tinkling cymbal. In Revelation 1, John could see that mighty vision of the Savior with feet as brass. So the theme running through these three chapters is the theme of brass. And you know, this first chapter in 2 Chronicles 12, Paul reminds us that these things were written aforetime for our learning. You see, there's much we can get out of this chapter in 2 Chronicles 12. I want us to speak to us this morning upon brass believers. Brass believers, if you wanted a title for the meeting. For each passage read has a reference to brass. You know, in the scriptures, brass can often speak of strength, of hardness, or durability. And in the case of the Savior, as we'll see later, it speaks in its own sweet and beautiful way for him. But in our first two cases, in Second Chronicles 12 and in First Corinthians 13, the brass is spoken of in an inferior way. It's spoken of in something that not in a lesser, but in a bad way. A brass that none of us want to have. But that's what I want to speak about, brass believers. In Second Chronicles 4, we read about bright brass. It tells us that it took up a high polish. Men could spend a long time in the temple of Solomon polishing the brass, bringing it up to have a good shine. To have a good shine that it would almost look like gold. But it wasn't the real thing. There was an abundance of gold in Solomon's temple, but there was also some brass. It spent, it took a long time to polish it and to have it to the shine that would glitter and there was shine that would be seen in the eye. But brass here in 2 Chronicles 12 and indeed in 1 Corinthians 13 is an inferior brass. And often brass speaks of something inferior, something lesser, something not as good as gold. To illustrate that, you'll remember in Daniel chapter 2. You'll remember whenever Nebuchadnezzar had that great dream and he brought his soothsayers, his magicians and the Chaldeans in to make head nor tail of the dream and they, they couldn't do it. So he had to get Daniel and he, he, he interpreted the dream and there was the grand image, head of gold, uh, shoulders and top of silver and a belly and thigh of brass. And of course, that speaks to us about that great dream of Nebuchadnezzar. It's that end times prophecy of those of the Gentile powers that would be in charge of it, would rule over Israel. The gold was Babylon. The silver torso was Medo-Persia. But of course, coming on down was brass. The brass was uh, the Grecian Empire under Alexander the Great. But that's simply a little illustration to show us that brass is inferior that great image of Daniel, it's, it, it decreased in its, in its value, it decreased in its hardness, it decreased in its uh, durability and hardness and strength. The lower down the statue we went in Daniel 2, the more weak, the less value, and the more inferior it got. So brass speaks of something inferior. <clears throat> you know, my friends, that I want to apply the thought of brass this morning to the, to the believer and I've told us the title is Brass Believers. It tells me that brass is inferior. I want to suggest to us this morning that a lot of believers are settling for brass rather than gold. 
Maybe there's someone in the meeting this morning and that could describe you. Takes up a good shine. Brings a good polish up. But it's not the real thing. You see, friends, the brass was inferior. That's what happened to Rehoboam. And we'll look at him now in a moment or two. Time came when he, when he went well. But it wasn't long before Shishak, king of Egypt, came and he stole the gold. He stole the golden shields. And he had to make the inferior ones of brass to try and keep up the show, to try and have the, the, it look good to the eye. But in his heart of hearts, he knew that it wasn't the real thing. Polishes well, brings up a good shine, but not real. Then we'll get into our chapter here then in Second Chronicles 12. My first point is this. There's the form of brass. You see, friends, how he, we need to see how he came to have these brass shields instead of the gold. First of all, there's the ways of Rehoboam. I'm sure if I were to ask some of you this morning, name me some of the kings of Israel. But some would mention King David and how he was a man after God's own heart. Others might say there was Saul and how he disobeyed two or three times and was a failure and the Spirit of God left him. After those, it was Solomon. And if I'm right, there was not a reign that was like unto Solomon's for its splendor, for its beauty, for its glory. And indeed, he could turn to the Queen of Sheba and say, that, or she could say, the half has not yet been told. But after Solomon came his son, and this is who we're reading about this morning, it was King Rehoboam. Rehoboam was marked by weakness. He was marked by weakness. He was marked by sin. And he was marked by, you could even say, immaturity. It was under Rehoboam that the kingdom of Israel was divided, divided between Israel and Judah. He was a man that wouldn't take advice from older people because it tells us in the chapter or two before here, for, for time's sake, we'll not read it, but it tells us that he wouldn't take the counsel of older men, older wise men in the kingdom of Israel. He wouldn't take their advice and he settled for the advice of the younger people, of the younger, of the younger men in the kingdom. And just in passing, perhaps some of you younger people, and I want to talk about that, but it's good to take the advice of the older ones that know better, have walked further and know more and have walked closer to the Lord than us. But that's by the way. Rehoboam was marked by weakness, immaturity, and indeed sin. <clears throat> you see, friends, it, was, it was, wasn't long, before, long after Rehoboam that the kingdom was divided and was, I think it was Jeroboam came. And they fought against each other for quite a while. So it was marked by warfare, weakness, and immaturity. He was inexperienced. And the kingdom was divided under Rehoboam. Yet, for all his weakness, for all his failures, for all his disobedience, and fighting with the, with the southern kingdom, he did go well for a while. Cast your eye to chapter 11 and verse number 17. It says, so they strengthened the king of Judah and made Rehoboam the son of Solomon strong. Three years, for three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. So for a, a space or a time span of three years, he did walk after the ways of Solomon and David. For three years they walked well in the ways of David. Now what were those ways? First Kings 15 and 5 tells us, because David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything he commanded him all the days of his life. It tells us there that's what the ways of David were. And it does tell us in chapter 11 that when the kingdom was divided, those that were perhaps more godly in the kingdom, the priests, the Levites, and those that wanted to put their trust in God did go to the side of Rehoboam rather than to the other side when the kingdom was divided. So he walked well for three years, but yet now he's found with brass shields. That tells me if I can apply it to the believer this morning, perhaps you did run well. Yes, there was the failures. Yes, there was the faults. Yes, there might have been flesh, which we'll come to. But you've went well for a season. Maybe that's speaking to someone this morning. Galatians 5 and verse 7, I wrote over this verse. You did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? You see, Rehoboam, for all his faults and failures, and we as more mere believers and human beings are weak, we fail, we stumble, but he ran well for three years, yet now at this point, he's found with brass shields. 
He ran well, but something hindered him. And you know, I wonder, is that someone in the meeting this morning? You've came in and you've shook Adrian and Roy's hand and you've came in and it looks like polished brass. It looks good. The untrained eye, it maybe looks like gold. But inside, you know that you're, you know, like Ray Boom, you've run well for a season, but then you've fallen short. Something's happened. I don't know what it is. Maybe the enemy got in. Maybe you've fed the flesh. Maybe you've fallen or stumbled during the week. I don't know. But it looks good. It's polished up. But <clears throat> you've fallen. So that's the ways of Rehoboam. He followed well for a while, but indeed it wasn't the real thing. And so what happened in the end? What was it? Well, in verse 12 it tells us, sorry, verse 1 of chapter 12. And it came to pass when Rehoboam had established the kingdom and had strengthened himself, he forsook the law of the Lord and all Israel with him. Backsliding and slipping away never starts with one. that always follows on. For all Israel followed with him. He went well, but what was the thing? What was that one thing that made him slip and find himself with brass shields? It says it there. It says he established the kingdom and strengthened himself. He forsook the law of the Lord. He strengthened himself. You know, there's a lot of believers this morning and we might think we're in a strong place. But the reality is when you're in a strong place, it's when the enemy's going to come. It's when we're most uh, vulnerable. It's when we're most weak. And the enemy's going to get in. He was in a strong place that he began to decline. You know, it tells us, and it tells us that I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. But I think this is what Rehoboam got in his mind. God had established the kingdom. He remembered the great reign of his father Solomon. And he came and he says, I'm the boy, I can do this now. But perhaps that was pride. Pride that got in. Proverbs 16 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. It was the same for King Uzziah. It says that his heart was lifted up to pride. And if I'm right, I think it was leprosy that he took because of pride. He started well, yet it tells us at the end of the chapter, in verse 14, and he did evil because he prepared not his heart to seek the Lord. He started off well, started off with gold, finished with a kingdom and divided in warfare, not seeking God, and with brass. Started well, but what a way to end, for it tells us, and Rehoboam slept with his fathers, was buried in the city of David, and Abijah's son reigned in his stead. He ended badly. I wonder, is there someone in the meeting this morning, and you're about to end badly? You're about to end badly. I don't know about you, but I want that abundant entrance. I want that when rapture comes or the Lord should call, I want the abundant entrance. I don't want to be found with brass shields. I want the gold shields. I trust it's the same for you. He was in a strong place by himself. He thought he was in a strong place. Reminds me of the church at Laodicea. Tells us in that the Lord could turn to the church of Laodicea and say, because you are strong and increased with goods and in need of nothing. They thought themselves in a strong place. They had everything. The Lord was on the outside, knocking at the door, looking in. Because you are increased and strong and increased with goods and have need of nothing. That's what happened to Rehoboam, to put it in New Testament terms. He was strong, increased with goods and in need of nothing. And there's so many places and individual believers like that. We think we're in such a strong place, we don't need the Lord. We have it all panned out. We can do it ourselves. I want to tell you, we can't do it ourselves. We need him. So that was the ways of Rehoboam. Then I want you to notice the worth of the gold. The ways of Rehoboam, the worth of the gold. You needn't turn to it. I'll tell you what the gold, what the gold was like in chapter 9. It tells us, and King Solomon made 200 targets. The word there is shields. 200 shields of beaten gold. 600 shekels of beaten gold went to one target. And 300 shields made he of beaten gold. 300 shekels of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. That's the making or the creation of these shields. There's the worth of these shields. They had the splendor of Solomon's reign. A kingdom marked by its glory. A kingdom marked by its wisdom and its splendor. This is what he had at the start. Those shields that Solomon made were what Rehoboam had at the start. 
You know, believers, I want to put it this way. I've looked at the worth of the ways of Rehoboam. I want to think of the worth of the gold. Because gold always represents something of God. It speaks of heavenly things. It speaks of his deity. It speaks of his glory. We could go into the tabernacle and the temple, and it's an interesting we start to study, study it out. The th- everything, the, the mercy seat and the ark of the covenant, we're all made of gold because it speaks of what is of God. It speaks of what is real. It speaks of, as the old saying goes, the real McCoy, the real thing. It was purely of God. You see, friends, if I can apply this, the worth of the gold to our walk, is there worth in your walk? Is there riches? Is the real thing there in your walk? They overlaid the temple and the tabernacle with gold. But I can apply it to our walk. Paul could say in 1 Corinthians 8, Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, or else wood, hay, and stubble. There's a beam of seat coming. Studying that out in our own uh, quiet times the last couple of weeks, it tells us that it shall be revealed by fire. For the fire shall reveal every man's work of what sort it is. And Paul could say it's either going to be built on a foundation of gold or it's going to be on foundations of wood, hay, and stubble. I think you see the wee connection I'm making there, I hope you do, about brass compared to gold. The real thing, the foundation of gold that, that Paul tells us to build upon versus the f- versus the not so good foundations, wood, hay, and stubble, we could apply it to the brass. Yes, where a bone fed his flesh. Soon we end up that way if we follow after the flesh. Galatians 5 and verse 19 tells us that the, that says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, and it gives us that list of them. I wonder, could any of them be found in us this morning? Romans 8 tells us, Walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. You see, friends, there's two natures still within the believer. There's the new nature, made a new creature, made a new creation in Christ, praise the Lord. But there's also that old nature that's still there. And there's a battle going on between them. And it's which you're going to feed. It's which that you're going to walk after. It's which that you're going to follow. Well, to determine whether you have the gold, the foundation of gold, or else you have a polished brass that may look good, but is not the real thing. You see, friends, <clears throat> you see, friends, there's much riches we can have. You say, Ewan, what gold is there for me? To have this foundation of gold, what is it? What gold really is there? Well, Paul could say indeed about the gold foundation and the beam of the judgment seat that was coming. And every man's work will be tried. But James could say we can be rich in faith. First Timothy 6 says, God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. Goes on to speak about rich and good works. It says in Colossians, tells us to let the God, let the word of Christ dwell in us richly unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding. And I could go on about the verses that tells us about the riches that are available to the believer. We can be rich. You know, if we don't walk the ways we should soon, we will become poor. And that's the point I need to get across. If we don't have the gold, will have the brass and will be poor. I wonder, is there someone in the meeting this morning, I'm not afraid to put it that way, you're a pauper this morning. You're poor because you don't have the riches of the gold. You don't have the riches. That, rich of the, that richness of the word, the faith, the good works, the abundance of his riches that he's made available to each and every one of us. Ephesians says, the God who has blessed us with all heavenly blessings in Christ Jesus. I wonder, do you know anything? Anything this morning, even the smallest little bit, about the riches and the blessings and the abundance of gold that's available to the believer in Christ this morning. The worth of the gold was hindered by the ways of Rehoboam because the enemy came in and took it. You know, Shishak, the king of Egypt, he's a picture of the enemy. He's a picture of the devil. He's a picture of the world, the flesh, and the devil. And whenever we... Don't walk the way we should. Shishak's going to get in. The devil's going to get in. He's going to sneak in. He's going to steal the golden shields. And we'll be left sitting rather rather weak and embarrassed and having to do something about it. And in most cases, most people are so weak they don't like to admit admit it. People are so backslid they don't like to admit it. 
People are so far from God, like Peter following afar off, they don't like to admit it. Rather, they get a form and they polish it up. Timothy tells us that in the, par- in the last days, perilous times shall come. Men will become lovers of their own selves, having a form, a form of godliness. And I fear this morning, maybe not in the lifeboat, but the Lord give me this word, you know your own heart, if there's a form there or if it's the real thing. So their goal speaks of the riches, but it also speaks about worship because it tells us there that he, where did he, t- where did he put these brass shields that he had to make? It's in, they were stolen from the, te- the temple. Solomon's temple speaks of worship. It was there that they came to worship. So it was inferior worship because of these brass sheens. And you know, maybe that's what's hindering our worship this morning. Maybe why there's, that's why there's so many leave before the table. Because you have brass sheens. The riches aren't there. You don't understand the riches of having the gold and the worships affected. There's not only the riches of the gold, I think I already sort of said it, but there's the reality of the gold. Because there's a reality. There was deterioration. He forfeited blessing. He forfeited the good for the bad. Maybe there's a lot of people compromising. You're forfeiting the good thing for the bad. I wonder what you're forfeiting the gold shields for this morning. Maybe it's pleasure. Maybe it's, uh, oh, I don't know. There's many things you can think about. Maybe it's pleasure. Maybe it's... uh, Maybe it's a little sin that you like to keep tucked away and only, uh, tucked away and not tell anyone. You're forfeiting the gold for the brass. Not only the worth of the gold, there's the weakness in the brass. The worth, the worth of the gold is contrasted with the weakness in the brass. His sub- substitution of brass shields for gold shows the fading glory of Judah as he resorts to measures to try and maintain an outward show. Indeed, brass looks like gold, and when shined, the sun would shine upon it. But when much we try to polish, we we'll polish it by Bible reading, polish it by going to meetings, hitting all the buzzwords. It's not the riches, and it's not reality. He tried to keep up a former appearance, but it wasn't the real thing. He, when the, en- the enemy came and took it, and indeed we could quote it, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, this freshness was stolen. The reality was stolen. The endeavor to try and keep up a show. You see, friends, 2 Timothy 3 and 5, we quoted it, it says, having a form of godliness. We're living off a cheap imitation. I wonder, are you living off a cheap imitation? Looks good. Hits the buzzwords. Come in, skirt, tie, big Bible. Looks good, but it's a cheap imitation. That's what Rehoboam had. It was a cheap imitation of the real thing. And just so you say, oh, who am I to tell you that? I got this word because it was something the Lord told me. In Job 38 and 11, it says, Hitherto shalt thou come, but no further. Of course, it's speaking about when God was saying to Job about the planet and the stellar heavens and the beauties of the earth. And he was telling Job of how he made the waters to come this far and no further. Do you allow me to explain that to you? You'll come this far, but no further, unless you have reality. You see, the Lord spoke to me and said, and anyone knows me, you know I'm a bit of a bookworm. And there's nothing wrong with books, and I'm say, not saying don't study. In fact, I'd encourage some of you younger people to spend the hours in the Word that you could, all the hours you can. But the Lord spoke to me and said, Ewan, the books can only take you so far. You can come this far, but no further. There has to be reality. There has to be riches. There has to be the gold shields. Don't satisfy. Don't settle for a cheap imitation of brass shields. No, go for the real thing. Job 38 and 11. This far shall you come, but no further. If you want to go through this morning, if you want to go through with God, you're going to have to let go of the props. You're going to have to let go of the cheap imitations. And you're going to have to, otherwise it'll be the same thing that Job, God could say to Job, this far shall you come, but no further. You see, friends, there's an all-seeing eye. We might look good. We might have it polished. But there's one that is open and before him and whom we have to do. He knows exactly what we have. He knows its worth. He knows its substance. He knows its reality. 
It tells us there, remember when Nathaniel was under the tree, the Lord could turn to Nathaniel and say, when you were under the fig tree, I knew you. He knows each and every one of us this morning. He knows whether we're hauling in brass or hauling in gold into this assembly this morning. You see, friends, there's a form of brass. I think we're finished there. We'll go to Corinthians very quickly over to 1 Corinthians 13. Maybe it's not a form of brass. I want you to think with me about the fickleness of brass. Because the Apostle Paul could say it here in 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity or love, I am become as a sounding brass or as a tinkling symbol. In chapter 12 there, you have the giving of the gifts of the Spirit and their relation to the body. In chapter 14, you have the gifts and their operation. But here you have their, their, their examination, if you like. Paul says you can be the most gifted person. You can have it all. You can be the most gifted of preachers. You can be the most gifted of singers. You can be the most gifted of open-air preachers or the most eloquent in prayer. But it could be like a sounding brass. That word there, tinkling cymbal or sounding brass, is the word clanging. Maybe you're like a clanging cymbal this morning or you're like a, you're like a sounding brass. You're a sounding brass this morning. Corinth, with all of its things that it had, was lacking in love. It was lacking in the one vital element so essential for the true functioning of any assembly or believer. Without love, it's merely noise. Without love, it's merely calling attention to yourself. Without love, it it's, could be anything. Paul says, though he were a gifted, a gifted apostle, could speak with and count as many gifts, they were nothing in comparison to love. Biblical illustrator put it this way, the only true deep refinement comes from love. I wonder this morning as we're talking about brass, are you a brass believer in a form or are you a brass believer in the fact that it's fickle? All noise, a sounding, a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal or is, there, or is the vital element there and that's love. You have a love for your brother and sister, and indeed the Lord dealt with my own heart in this. Do you have a love for the brother or sister sitting in the pew in front, beside, or behind you? If you, do, you could have the best of gifts, you could have the best eloquence, you could be the best in prayer, the best in the pulpit, the best in the open air, but unless there's love, it's a sounding brass, friends. There's the necessity of love. When a gifted apostle speaks here, he counts it all as worthless, Without, when, and compared to love. There's the necessity of love. Then there's the qualities of love. I'm going to do this point quickly. It says, In all beauty of perfection and power and value, it tells us what's love like. I'll read it out. She suffereth long and is kind. She envieth not. She vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. She does not behave itself unseemly. She seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked. Thinketh no evil, rejoiceth not in the iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. You see, friends, the love that they were talking about here, the whole idea, friend, is it set forth for the believer's life. A life of love, you could put it. We should live, she suffereth long, self-restraint is shown, she's slow to take offense, there's no desire to retaliate, she doesn't lose her temper, she's kind to the brother in the prayer meeting, she's kind to the sister that's struggling, the success of others is not grudged, she's learned in whatsoever state to be content, there's no desire for gain or to appear superior, there's no pushing and shoving or gossiping or any of the sort. No, indeed, we could make a list and go on and take each one of those qualities of love and speak on it. She's not prideful. She's not arrogant. There's no self-esteem. There's all manner of godliness, lovers of truth with a heart that is in tune with God. That's what it is to walk in love and not as a sounding brass. Everything else is fickle and all manner of godliness. There's the form of brass, the fickleness of brass, the... Uh, necessity of love, the qualities of love. Then there's the permanence of love in this chapter. For it says, love never faileth. Brass will fail. Brass will fail. And bra brass will fall away. 
but love suffers long and never faileth. So if there was a burning zeal, friend, in which one could deliver up the body to the flame and yet, lo- and yet not love be the motive for it. Paul said that there. If he give his body to be burned, such zeal, such go get to go through with God, yet if there's no love, it's as a sounding brass. You can trace each one of those beautiful qualities of love in the life of the Lord Jesus, and indeed we'd love to do it. You take each one of those qualities of love in 1 Corinthians 13, and you trace it in the life of the Lord, and you'll be blessed when you find them. But friends, you can trace it through in the life of the Lord. God, and you know, friends, you say to me, Ewan, what is love? What is Bible love? 1 John 4 tells us, He that loveth not, knoweth not God. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us. And his love is perfected in every detail, in every little compartment of the heart. The love of God is perfected and he dwells in us when we love one another. There's the form of brass in Second Chronicles 12 with Rehoboam. There's the fickleness of brass if we have not love in our hearts. Our last verse, our last chapter there was in Revelation 1 and it's a nice one to speak about. The fickleness of brass, the form of brass, I want you to think with me about the feet of brass. Because when John was on the Isle of Patmos, he could see this mighty... We could find it, there we go. If we, he could see this mighty vision. That's why I chose that one of those hymns this morning. Immortal, invisible, God only wise, the ancient of days. That's the one surrounded by light that John could get a picture, a vision, a glimpse, a sight of in Revelation chapter 1. They shall say he had hair as white as wool, speaks of his dignity and his wisdom, a voice as many waters, the one who spake like none other man. His voice was as many waters, but it was the feet of brass that was on the Lord that I want to close the meeting with. You might say to me, Ewan, how do I get this going? You've been telling me I've been living off a cheap imitation. You've been telling me I have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. You're telling me there's a form of brass and a fickleness of brass. How do I get this gold that you've been talking about? These abundant riches that are in Christ Jesus. How do I get the riches? How do I get the reality? This is this point. It's looking at the one with the feet of brass. It's looking at this vision of him and the glory that will help us to walk and to go through and to go for gold. Go for gold, friend. Because in Revelation chapter 1, Perhaps after close examination you say, and you have to admit it, that you don't have the gold. You're a brass believer this morning. This Sunday morning, Lord's Day morning in the lifeboat, you're a brass believer, but you want the gold. Well, I'm glad if you want the gold this morning, for so do I. And if you want the gold, where you listen in the last five or ten minutes, and we'll try and tell you how you get the gold, how you can live this life of gold shields and not have the enemy of Egypt or the devil come in and steal the gold steal the gold and you have to have a polished imitation of brass. You see, friends, we glimpse at this man in glory. Brass for believers, as we've established, is a picture of weakness and inferiority. But when spoken of in the case of the Lord Jesus, it's very, very different. It represents something very, very different. If we want gold, first thing is a glimpse at him. There's the seven majestic features that John could see, but one of them was a focus on the feet, a focus on the brass feet that, that walked in the midst of the seven candlesticks and the lampstands. No impurity was in it. Brass, when speaking about the Lord Jesus, it speaks of refinement. It speaks of purity. It speaks of a holy, righteous one that walks with, in judgment. And a, a holy, righteous one. You know, my friends, compare them to the, in the Gospels. Those feet that walked the dusty roads around the Galilee and the Sea of Tiberias, in and out of the houses, healed the blind, caused the lame to walk. Those feet, the one that sat on the wall by the woman of Samaria, for he was tired. Those same feet that walked this earth are now seen by John in the glory. And their feet like brass. They now tread majestically in the midst of the, in the midst of the, of the candlesticks. But you see these feet of brass, it's that they were put through the furnace. That links back to the old brazen altar in the, ta- in the tabernacle. 
It was all made, some of it was made of gold, but it was made of brass. It speaks of one who bore the judgment for our sins. That's what brass speaks about as well in connection with the Lord Jesus. The one who bore our own sins on his body on the tree. One who the fire of God tested, tried, and he came out as the one holy, harmless, and undefiled, separate from sinners, as the one that it speaks about. And fell upon him, the fire raged, but perfect righteousness came out. That's the idea in the feet of the brass. The one who was tested and tried by the fire and has come out like fine brass. You see that word brass there in, First Corin- in uh, Revelation 1. The word's different to those words of brass and where we read before. It's an inferior type of brass in the other chapters, but this one is the idea of fine, white, or shining brass. If you have the new breed, it tells you that in the margin. It's fine, white, shining brass, a mixed alloy of perfection, of gold and brass mixed, is what John could see. The glimpse of this holy, righteous one and the glory that searches out all things. We already mentioned that. He's the one that searches the hearts and trieth the hearts of all men. We need to concentrate all of our thoughts upon him this morning. You know, when we often talk with Stephen about it, I don't know why it is, but there's believers and they don't seem to enjoy the things about him. You know, friend, I I could do it and I'm sure Stephen could do it. We could take a whole meeting just simply on these different characteristics of the Lord in Revelation 1. It's to be caught up with him, friend, and his qualities. And his traits and the things that marked his outward ways, his moral and heavenly glory, is what we need to get a sight of. You know, my friends, I want what we have to do. What have I to do with idols when such visions fill mine eye? Why be occupied with shadows while the substance passes by? You see, friends, that's it. We're satisfied with the shadows instead of the substance. We're satisfied with the brass rather than the gold. The substance rather, the shadows rather than the substance. Realize that it's He and He only that can give us that gold that remains, that will last, that gold foundation that the Apostle Paul could talk about. You know, you say to me, Can He really give me the gold? Well, you just have to turn over a chapter or two to the church. Was it the church of Laodicea or was it uh, Ephesus? Yeah, I think it was Ephesus because he says, You've left your first love. But you know what he could say? It says, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire. Job could say, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Also, how do you get gold? The first thing is to get a glimpse of the Holy One. The second thing is to let him try us. Let him put us through the trial. Because Peter says, knowing that your trial worketh, uh, kind of not strange concerning the fiery trial with us to try thee. We're partakers of his sufferings. Every trial, every sorrow, every wound, every walk molds us and shapes us into the one that we're meant to be. Thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me after thy will. You see, friend, that's how we get the gold. But there's also his word. Well, first of all, Zechariah says, and I, will, and I will bring the third part through the fire and will refine them and I will try them as gold is tried, sifted and brought through, sifting trials and tests and persecution. Maybe there's someone this morning, maybe I've been a wee bit hard, but you know, friend, maybe you're in the battle. Maybe you're going through that furnace of affliction and fire of affliction this morning. Well, we're praying for you, but remember, it worketh gold. It worketh gold. That's how you get the gold. Going through the trial. Thanks be unto God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, friends, all of the value must be acquired and possessed from him and from him alone because he has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, and redemption in 1 Corinthians uh, 3, 33. Because it tells us anything we get is from him. Any wisdom, any sanctification, any redemption, any glory that's imparted unto us, that robe of righteousness we get, those gold shields that we get, those crowns that we're going to get at the Bema, we're going to cast them back at his feet. We're going to cast them at his feet because it all was, is, and ever will be because of him. In Romans 16, we're told about a palace approved in Christ. You see that we were approved and we're nearly finished. 
That we were to prove is the word for metals and it's the word for money. The reality and the riches of the gold is there in, a, in the life of a palace. He says, he says, salute a palace approved in Christ. It's the word for money. It wasn't fake. It wasn't fake. It was the real thing. That it's also the word for metals. He'd been went through the furnace of affliction. He'd been shaped. He'd been molded. He'd been made the person that God would have him to be. There's an example. A palace was approved unto God. Then then Paul in the Philippines could say, he's given us an example as an example of one who bo- he parted with all that once he held dear. He parted with everything save to know Christ and him crucified. That's the key. There's two examples. You say to me, Ewan, is it really possible to have this gold? Well, there's two examples. A palace was approved. A word that's got a monetary, a money sense and a metal sense to the word approved. He was the real thing and he had the riches. The apostle Paul said he counted all things but loss that he might gain the greater thing, which was to know Christ. Two men that had the riches and two men that had the reality. In Isaiah 60 and verse 17, it says, speaking about the Lord Jesus in the coming day, in the millennial, it says, for brass, I will bring gold. For brass, I will bring gold. Lord Jesus Christ can give it to us. The question is, do we want it? Do we want the gold this morning? A glimpse at him, a willingness to go through the fire and have him mold us and shape us. Finally, there's the word of God. Because, friends, the word is like gold. In Proverbs 30 and verse 5, it says, Every word of God is pure. You see that wee word pure there in Proverbs 30? It's the words five times it's translated, it's translated goldsmith. And three times it's translated the word refine. The word refines us. The word shapes us. And David could say about the word of God, It's more to be desired are they they than than gold. Yea, much fine gold. In Psalm 19 and 10. How do we go for gold? So we don't become a brass believer. First first of all, friend, we get a glimpse of the one with the brass feet in the glory. Second of all, a willingness to go through the fire and have him mold us and make us after the one we should be. And third of all, we come to the word which is as fine gold. The one, the word that reflects and shows us uh, what, who and what and how we should be. Brass believers. Are you a brass believer? Well, friends, you go for gold this morning. And hopefully you'll not be like old Rehoboam and the enemy won't come in and steal the gold. Amen. We're going to pray. Then we'll close with uh, 555, is it? Sure. I'll find it. (laughs) We'll close in prayer and then we'll sing our last hymn. Father, as we come into thy presence again, Lord, we... Thank you for the riches that are available in Christ Jesus. We thank thee, Lord, for that you have made unto us an abundance of things to be had. If, Lord, we will just go through with God and let him have his way. We pray that no believer in the meeting this morning would settle for the cheap imitation of of brass, like old Rehoboam did. But we would be men and women that would go through and go for gold, and that we would know what it is to have the riches and the reality of the Saviour. We pray that each one of us would have what the Savior died to give us and that we would stay close to thee in these, the closing days of time. Be with us now, Father. Thank you again for thy help. And as we go into the table, we pray that many would stay and that we would seek and praise thee. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.